series is all about personal calling, and it's Back to the Future. Today we go super high tech with uh, something very old, <laughs> and of course I need a music stand. Like I said, super high tech. We're with it today. Or we will be with it eventually. This was yours, wasn't it? Man, people are too tall. <clears throat> Six feet high. Anyway, uh, we are in fourth week, I believe. This is the fourth week of the series. Which means, of course, now we are to Back to the Future Part 1, Moses and Joshua. Everybody with me on that one? Okay, good. Uh, yeah, exactly. It makes total sense. Um, the order got all mixed up. And that's, that's the beauty of working with a series that is based on time travel. Is, is it doesn't matter what the order's in, we're going back and forth, and today I'm really, really going to mess with you on time travel, and matters of time travel. And can you toss me the uh, thing? Before it's... You're not going to toss it? And eventually, this will have something to do with something. I'm going to apologize right now. I tried to be more adult about wearing a t-shirt this morning, uh, but this thing's not working for me. So, I'm, I apologize, I'm wearing a t-shirt, we're all going to have to get over it and deal with it. Now, Michael Jordan. Yes. Michael Jordan is, is the basketball player that all basketball players are held to the standard of. Because Michael Jordan was just unbelievable in every position. Everybody wears number 23. Everybody knows why we wear number 23. Because that was the greatness. I want to be like Mike. I want to connect to that. But at one point in his career, he had retired. He had experienced this traumatic, horrifying event in his life. And he wanted to go live it to the fullest in a totally different way. And he had retired. And when he came back, he didn't look quite right. And he didn't look quite right partly because he was no longer number 23. He was 45. See, there's a reason I wear a t-shirt. It's okay. It's sermon uh, illustration. We'll get through this. But he came back as number 45, and everybody looked at him and said, you know, yeah, he's back, and he's good. He's good. He scored 55 points in, like, his fourth game back. But he's still... He's not Mike yet. He's not Michael Jordan for some reason. And this amazing thing happened in Michael Jordan's career where when he came back, he suddenly wasn't himself. And, and it was like he was afraid to put on number 23 because that number was held to such a different standard. I mean, he was the defensive player of the, of the year while being the leading scorer and the leading uh, steal person. The steel champion is what they call it for some reason. He got the most steals. Anyway, he's the best all around. He had three-peated before he retired. He went out at the top of his game, and when he came back, it was like he was afraid to put that 23 back on his... back on. Sorry. I'm not the most eloquent this morning, and that's okay. So instead, he went with number 45. And he tried to make this new Michael Jordan happen, and he tried, he tried to just move on, and it didn't last. And even, it was in the middle of the playoffs that he finally said, you know what, no, I need to, no. Done with 45, I had my shot, I'm putting back on the 23, and away we go. And the rest is history. They lost that year, but he went the next year and into an immediate three-peat again, and, and Michael Jordan was Michael Jordan all over again. This week we're talking about Moses and Joshua, Mo and Josh. Um, don't turn with me just yet. Because what we're going to do is we're actually going to start, and, and Sarah, you can go ahead and lose the high-tech graphics that I worked so very hard on. It's amazing what tracing can do. Um, 
Because what we're going to do is we're going to go straight into the story of Joshua at the same point at which Michael Jordan was number 45 in his career. There's this point at Joshua where he's sitting outside of Jericho, and you can see him just trying to figure out what in the world he's doing there. Joshua, of all people, he was a servant to Moses. He was just the assistant. I mean, he was son of nobody, right? Joshua, son of none, is what it says. He's, he's just, he's just Joshua. He's just there and in the backgrounds, and now he's sitting on the precipice of war, on the edge of war, and he's being called to lead a nation to take over this promised land, to take this inheritance. And in Joshua chapter 5, uh, verse 13, like I said, don't, you don't have to turn with me there. I made it easy for myself and then forgot. We pick up at Joshua and we see him in the midst of this struggle. When Joshua was, was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with sword in hand. Joshua went up to him and demanded, are you friend or are you foe? Because we're on the edge of battle here. This is about to happen. And are we starting tonight? I don't know. Neither one, he replied, I am the commander of the Lord's army. At this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. This is easy enough to do, right? Now, here's what's going to happen. Can you pull that up a little bit more, Sarah? Thank you. High tech. And we've got a shadow here. This will make sense as we go. We're not, it, it won't be a shape, but it will take shape. <laughs> um, think of this as a timeline and this as a timeline. And as Joshua's sit, standing outside Jericho, as Joshua's looking out on Jericho thinking, how in the world am I going to do this? He has this experience with the commander of the Lord's army, and he's told to take off his sandals. He's told right off the bat, yeah, you're going to do this, but you have to start by acknowledging that where you are is holy land, and that God is greater than who you are. And that's going to bring us instantly into a flashback, because as Joshua's standing there contemplating all of this, of course he's looking way back into the past and trying to understand how did we get here. Because he wants to understand that so he can go forward into the future. And how we got here, as soon as that guy says... The place where you're standing is holy. Take off those sandals. Of course, Joshua's thinking way back to the back to Moses. And Moses in the burning bush. Go ahead and turn with me here. Because this is where it's going to connect uh, these two stories to start with. The burning bush takes place at ch Exodus chapter 3. And the easiest way to do this today is going to find two pieces of paper. You're going to leave one in the Exodus area, and you're going to leave one in the Joshua area, because we're going to do some flipping back and forth. And we're going to start right off the bat at, at the very tip top of Exodus chapter 3. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He, he led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. And there's the connection. They're both standing on holy ground. They're both at the beginning of this point, on the edge of something. Moses doesn't realize it yet. Joshua absolutely realizes it. But the starting point is right here, 
that you're to take off your sandals because you're on holy ground. Because at this point in time, what you're starting off doing is saying, God is greater than I am, and I will worship him. And that's the beginning point here. This is part one, I suppose. In verse 6, God goes on to say, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He connects himself with this history, with this story that they all know, that they all told each other. They, as soon as God says these things, Moses knows who God is in each of these stories, in each of these lives. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. I may be God, and I may be huge, but I hear the cries of my people. I love my people, and here I am getting ready to do something about it. Verse 8 so I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt. That's what Moses' name was all about, to draw out. Into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. The land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Yes, I got through it. <laughs> Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me and have... I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. Moses is the original. Moses is number 23. Moses is who everybody looks at and says, man, that dude, he knew God face to face. Three religions today look back to Moses and honor and revere him because of the relationship, because of the position that Moses had, because he was leading this nation, because this is Moses, the great one of God. And he's called away from this moment, he's called out of this moment to go, to lead his people out of Egypt, to take on the superpower of the day. So of course, being number 23, Moses says, yeah, give me the ball, I will take it to the hole. But Moses protested to God, wait, what? Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. Okay, that's okay. Let's go and do it. But Moses protested, wait, what? If I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am or I will be what I will be. God simply says, Yahweh, I am. What an amazing name to give yourself. What an amazing name of our God to know that in the midst of all this, he's not saying, I was the God of Abraham and of Isaac. I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac. And I connect all the way through all of that to all of this. And now you are coming to connect to this, Moses. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. The starting point, that moment at which you find yourself saying, how did I get here? Sure, I may have done amazing things in the past. Maybe I haven't done anything with my life up to this point. Who knows how you get to this moment in time where you're standing outside of Jericho saying, I know what I'm supposed to do, 
but that's Jericho, and that's terrifying. Or, or, or you're coming back to the situation that you, you succeeded at in the past, just like Jordan putting back on the jersey, and you're scared of what that moment might be. Maybe you're trying to fill somebody else's shoes. You saw how they did it, and now you've got to live up to that. And these are big shoes to fill. And God starts everything off by saying, take off those big shoes. And start by knowing that I am. And that's the, that's the starting point here. Is that everything that's going to come to pass, everything that's going to happen, is going to start right here with God. That everything that we are being called to do in our lives, whatever it may be, big or small, God is there with you. So we're going to move on from there. And we're going to talk about the next step, so to speak. Uh, for Moses, we're going to go along his timeline a, bit, a little bit. Skip down, or whatever, skip on down to Exodus chapter 12. And we're going to do, uh, we're going to start at verse 21, after I get a little bit of water. And try not to drown the mic. <clears throat> See, from this moment on, Moses fights and argues a little bit more with God, and they strike a deal eventually, and, and Moses starts to lead. Moses starts to take that position. And, and here at the point that we're coming in is the Passover. But this is the culmination of all of the plagues that are hitting. All of the plagues that are coming. And this amazing thing is happening at this moment in time. That, that, that God is here and he is telling us to follow. And okay, so let's follow, let's go. And then these plagues happen. And there's frogs. And there's locusts. And there's blood. And there's darkness. And there's these things that just... Really? How is, how is that following God? There's, there's a slight ridiculousness to it. There's a big purpose. But, you know, frogs? Really? Bugs? Dark? It's, it's, it's a little odd. And it requires something that we'll see happening here, starting at verse 21. Moses called all the elders of Israel together and said to them, Go out, pick a lamb or young goat for each of your families. Slaughter the Passover animal. Drain the blood into a basin. A little gross. Take a bundle of hyssop branches and dip it into the blood. Brush the hyssop across the top and sides of the door frames of your house. No one may go out through the door until morning. For the Lord will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe, the Lord will pass over your house. He will not permit the, his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. We're going to pause there for a moment. Because this is where all of these plagues culminate. All of these plagues come to pass the faith. A ridiculous faith. That, that seriously, you're going to go through and you're going to kill all of the firstborn in the land. And while there were those plagues that were just for the Egyptians and not for the Israelites, this one, at the culmination point that you would think, okay, if we're killing people now, we're obviously just going to kill the Egyptians. This one was going to affect the Israelites as well. Unless... They followed this rule. Unless they had this ridiculous faith. They had seen the frogs and the locusts and they had done all these things and they had experienced all these things and now they're being called out to have this faith. And he takes it even a step farther. He takes it past faith for the night. And he says, remember these instructions are a permanent law that you and your descendants must observe forever. This doesn't just happen for tonight. This is something that we're going to do right now, and it's going to go on, because we are getting out of Egypt. This isn't an if-then. This is just how it is. God says, this is what is happening, period. And Moses says, this is what is happening, period. And the Israelites are faced with that moment in time, 
Do I trust God enough? Do I have faith to do this silly, silly thing? Will I step out and will I have faith in that God? Skipping on down to verse 28. So the people of Israel did just as the Lord had commanded through Moses and Aaron. And that night at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn son of the Pharaoh who sat on the, his throne to the firstborn son of the prisoner in the dungeon, even the firstborn of their livestock were killed. Pharaoh and all his people and all the people of Egypt woke during the night, and loud wailing was heard throughout the land of Egypt. There was not a single house where someone had not died. Pharaoh said for Moses and Aaron during the night, Get out, he ordered. Leave my people and take the rest of the Israelites with you. Go and worship the Lord as you requested. Faith. Faith is what it takes. Faith is what it requires for something that you've never seen before in your life. For a God who is all about love to show you that there is a sacrifice involved in following God. To have this faith. Which brings us right back down to Jericho, to Joshua at Jericho. Joshua chapter 6 Because what's happening here is these people had to have faith. They had to have faith first off to take off their sandals and to acknowledge that God is bigger than they are. And then they had to have faith to follow through with doing these things that God was calling them to do. To follow through with these ridiculous things. And just as they did it for Moses, they're going to do it for Joshua here at Jericho. Because the instructions of the Lord are this, starting at verse 1 of chapter 6. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go in or out. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. He doesn't say, I am going to give them to you. He says, I have given them to you. Yes, there's a great big wall. Yes, they're big and scary, and they've got big guns or, you know, swords or whatever it is they had at the time. They can conquer you. They can curse splat you flat. But I have given them to you. It has already happened. Now, here's what you do. Here's the ridiculous thing that I'm calling you to. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times, with the priests blowing the horn. When you hear the priests give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can, then the walls of the town will collapse, and the people can charge straight into town. What? This is a military strategy? Can you give me something a little bit better? Are you sure you're not the commander of the marching band? Can I have the commander of the army, please? It requires a faith in the ridiculous. Because there are things that God is going to call us to that seem nothing whatsoever like what He has called us to. There are going to be moments where we find ourselves flipping burgers, or filling out reports, or doing those things that are so mundane and frustrating and annoying, and yet, somehow, they will put us in the position to still be able to touch lives. We'll still have the chance to have God come in and work through us. Somehow, walking around a town for six days, and then shouting, is going to bring your inheritance of a promised land to you. Somehow, God, I am, is going to work through whatever it is 
that he has called you to. So the first step is acknowledging God. The second step is, is because of acknowledging God, having the faith that is not just about believing that it will happen, but is about putting feet to that and actually going and doing it. Believing that somehow frogs in a land will get you out of that land. That somehow walking around a town will bring the walls down. Now we're going to do a twofer. Because, uh, I lost my visual. There we go. That's okay. Because what's going to happen here is, like I said, we're messing with time. So I don't want to hear that the Jericho happens before the Jordan River in this. But we're going to bring both of them forward at the same time. And while I can't juxtapose... Go ahead, Sarah, you're fine. Sorry. Uh, while I can't read both exactly at the same time, uh, what we'll do is we're going to start at the Red Sea, Exodus chapter 14. We've already seen that God is who He says He is. That God is I Am. And that from that we have the faith to be able to do these things. Now we, wherever we find ourselves in this story, maybe we find ourselves as that nation looking for the leader. Maybe we're looking for somebody that God is going to put in our lives that we can say, yes, God is behind them and I need to follow. Maybe you're Joshua on the edge of Jericho saying, I'm just Josh. I'm, I'm not the leader of a nation. I don't know where you find yourself today, but wherever you find yourself, it will be in, in this moment for sure. Uh, Exodus chapter 14, starting at verse 13. Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. See, here we had to have feet. This time we have to keep those feet still and watch God just do it. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Sure, there's a giant sea right in front of them. I didn't set this up. They've gotten out of Egypt, and now the armies are coming after them, and they're standing in front of the Red Sea. Get moving. You know, run into that sea. So there is an element of crazy faith to this as well. Now Moses, pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they will charge in after the Israelites. My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots and his charioteers. When my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. And he has him come and do this, and he has him raise his staff. And Moses is standing there, and we all know that amazing image that there's the Red Sea, and it's parting, and Charlton Heston has that robe on, and he's, the waters are going all over, and maybe there's a whale coming through that you can see. It's amazing and so cool. And through it all, it's God's glory that's being shown. That the Israelites will walk through on dry ground. That despite the impossible, God will make it possible. Despite all those ridiculous, mundane things that we have to do with our everyday lives, having to get new tires for the car or put it in for the repair, having to pay those bills that just keep stacking up, God will work through these things. God will keep you going through these things. And when it seems at its most impossible, He will part the seas and make it possible. And we're going to skip on down to verse 29. Because as all of this happens, the 
people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground, as the water stood up like a wall on both sides, and that is how the Lord rescued Israel from the hand of the Egyptians that day. And the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the seashore. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. God is amazing. We have put feet to our faith, and he has followed through with it. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. And this is where I say, wherever you find yourself in that position, maybe you find yourself looking for that man of God, that woman of God, looking for somebody that can help guide you through this situation in your life. God will give you that person. You will see God working through that person in your life. Maybe you find yourself being Moses, being the original Jordan. Maybe he's got 23 on, but he's still scared to do it sometimes. And here he is... <laughs> Parted the Red Sea. And it's all because God was working through it all. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. If you find yourself in that position, know that it is God who will work through you. I almost got ahead of myself. Connected to this is the Jordan River. Uh... Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3, starting at verse 14. So the people left their camp to cross the Jordan, and the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead with them. It was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the Ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam. If I remember right, that was about 20 or 30 miles away that it started piling up. So, of course, the people in Adam are like, what's happening? At the water below that point flowed on to the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on the dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. They waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. See, that's, the, that's what's happening here. There's all these parallels going on between Moses and Joshua. And Joshua is sitting in that moment, sitting, standing in that moment saying, How are you making this happen? How am I supposed to fill Moses' shoes? How am I going to take over this position? And God starts it all off by saying, Let's cross a river. Because you saw Moses do it. You knew this happened. Now we're going to do it with you. Skip on down to chapter 4, verses 10 through 18. Not 10 through 18. We're going to skip ahead to verse 21. No, wow, sorry. I wrote this down wrong. Verse 12. The armed warriors from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half-tribe of Manasseh led the Israelites across the Jordan just as Moses had directed. These armed men, about 40,000 strong, were ready for the battle, and the Lord was with them as they crossed over to the plains of Jericho. See, this time when they're crossing the river, they're crossing the river ready for war. Moses drew them up and out. They were a people. They were strong. They were big. There were a lot of these people. And as Joshua takes them, he takes them and he leads them in. And they're about to take over this inheritance. Moses takes them out. Joshua takes them in. And in the same way, there's all these parallels that keep on happening between their timelines. There's all these moments that Joshua, as the servant of Moses, would have looked at and said, 
I remember that. I remember that. And now you've put me here and I have to serve that same position. And yet the Israelites in the same way had to remember this. Because in verse 14, that day, the Lord, jo the Lord made Joshua a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. And for the rest of his life, they revered him as much as they had revered Moses. Just as at the Red Sea, Moses stood there and everybody looked and said, God is working through him. I will follow. The Israelites did the same thing right here with Joshua. God is working through him, and I will follow. God is working through you, and he will work through you. We are being called to these things, and they, they look scary, and they sound scary, and sometimes they're big, and sometimes they're small. Whether you're leading a nation, or whether you're having a conversation with an individual, it can be scary. And you can look around and you can see all those people in your life that you say, you know, they're much better at this than I am. Maybe I shouldn't be here. I like watching Mike preach sometimes. Maybe he should come up and finish this for me. And we look at that and we say, I don't, mm, uh, I don't know. I'm not Moses. I'm not number 23. I shouldn't put that jersey on. I'll just wear number 45 and sit over here by myself. I'm Joshua, son of Nun. I'm, I'm just Josh. I'm going to sit over here, and I don't, mm, I don't think I should do this. Last week, we talked about Jonah. We talked about those. Before that, we talked about Joseph. We've talked about Peter. We've talked about all of these people that it's so hard to look at and say, well, it's so easy to look at and say, you know, that's them. I'm just Jack. I, mm, I don't know that I should stand up here and who am I to do this and who am I to go out there and talk to that person about what Jesus has done in my life. And who am I to stand up and to lead a Bible study? Who am I to stand up on the stage and sing songs at you, with you, for you? Who am I to take you aside and say, you know, I feel like maybe I should be praying with you? Who am I to go out onto those streets and see those people in need and to pull them aside and say, I know what it is that you need? Who am I to go all the way down to Mexico City and enter into a relationship with an individual that will impact their life. Who am I? You're who God is calling you to be. And ultimately, it doesn't matter about all of those other things, about all of those scary things, about the ridiculousness of the situation, about the enormity of the situation. Because ultimately what's going to happen, and we're going to see it <laughs> in a funny place, because none of us ever look at this moment in time, we're going to see it as Moses passes that torch off to Joshua. Deuteronomy chapter 31. We've gone through Moses' timeline, and now we're going to end up right here. And in, Moses, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, Moses had, been, had finished giving these instructions to all the people of Israel, and he said, I am now 120 years old. I am no longer able to lead you. The Lord has told me, you will not cross the Jordan River. But the Lord your God will cross over ahead of you. He will destroy nations living there, and you will take possession of their land. Joshua will lead you across the river just as the Lord had promised. The Lord will destroy the nations living in the land just as he destroyed Sihon and Og, the king of the Amorites. The Lord will hand over to you the people who live there, and you must deal with them as I have commanded you to. The Lord is with you, and he will do all of these things through you, because it started with him in the first place. All you have to have is the feet to go through it. Verse 6, so be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not panic before them, for the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail nor abandon you. Then Moses called for Joshua as all Israel watched and said to him, Be strong and courageous, 
For you will lead these people into the land that the Lord swore to your ancestors he would give them. You are the one who will divide it among them as their grants of land. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail nor abandon you. Be strong and courageous. And even down in verse 23, we see it one more time. Be strong and courageous. Three times in Deuteronomy chapter 31, we see Moses telling Joshua and Israel, yeah, I'm not going to be with you anymore. 23 is moving on. And 45 is coming in. But he's going to be just as good. Be strong and courageous. And he's not going to be just as good because of anything that he does. He's going to be just as good because it's the same God that was with Abraham, that was with Isaac, that was with Jacob, that was with Moses, that was with Joshua and Peter and Jonah, and all of these people that is right here in this room with you today, that is calling you to those things today. And he says, be strong and courageous. And if that makes you think of something, it absolutely should. Because in Joshua chapter 1, we find Joshua having a moment Obviously, much in the same way that we found him in the very first part down here of Jericho, saying, Who am I? So in Joshua chapter 1, and we're going to finish with this, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people. Yikes. Looking forward and looking backward, we know how this story goes. We know the hugeness of this situation. And here's Joshua in the middle of it all. You will lead these people across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on the land that I have given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors that I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate them, turning either from the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God says, be strong and courageous. And we see in this situation that this bookends the whole thing. The Moses is up here. The Joshua is down here. And the, in the middle and in between and all throughout, be strong and courageous. What is it that God is calling you to do today, tomorrow? Who knows which day it is. That's why we get to mess with time. And ultimately, these timelines, whether it's Joshua's life. I love looking at Abby when I'm doing this stuff. She's so into these things. Ultimately... It doesn't matter who it is in this situation. Sanitary and whatnot. God says, oh, come on. It's his timeline. 
God says, whoever's behind this, I am in front of it. I am the one that is leading you. It is not Moses. It's not Joshua. It doesn't matter. I could have a rock stand in that place, and it would still happen. Take off those sandals. Yeah, you've got big shoes to fill. Yeah, 23 was better than all the rest. But he was only better because I made him better. He goes all the way back to that burning bush, and he says, I am is with you. Or you know. <laughs> Wherever you find yourself on this timeline, wherever your timeline is on this, no. Thank you very much. I'm Mr. Jack. Thank you. I, I can't have you painting up your body. <laughs> whether you identify with Peter or with Jonah, whether you are standing there in that moment about to attack a nation terrified, whether you know that it is Moses coming before you and you've got those huge shoes to fill. Maybe you know that you're being called to something nobody's ever been called to before. And that's terrifying. Maybe you know exactly what it is you're being called to and you're not scared one bit. Be strong and courageous. Because I am is with you. Yes, we're being called to fill big shoes. Yes, we're being called to do amazing things. We're called to the entire world. But we're going to do it one step at a time. No matter how mundane, no matter how small, no matter how big, I am is with you throughout it all. And because of that, we will accomplish great things whether it's drawing a nation out, whether it's putting a nation in, whether it's having a conversation with an individual that will help them understand that they are loved by the God of this universe because I am is with them. Whatever it is, you are being called to big shoes. It all starts by taking them off and acknowledging that it's God's timeline that's going to cover us all.